Jason is pointing out, it's a little bit more involved in that, in that you have to actually complete an annotated bibliography. And so really, uh, I don't want you to stress out too much about this in terms of like formatting your bibliography and all that. I just want you to understand that the point of this assignment is to make sure that you are not picking a topic for the entire quarter that you have not thought anything about, right? Because that's going to suck for you, <laughs> right? I want to make sure that you have spent some time uh, thinking about this topic. Um, I'm requiring you to phrase the topic in a what I call a neutral fashion right, because this is a philosophy class, so we're not, I mentioned this last week, we're not starting off by presuming anything to be true, so even if you already think you know what your position is going to be, we want to kind of step back and figure out how to frame it as close to objectively as is possible, right, you might not think that true objectivity is possible, we want to get as close to that as we can, and so the annotated bibliography is making sure that you're researching at least two opposing sides of whatever issue you've chosen, right? So not every issue is binary, right? There could be many sides, but you're looking at at least two different views on that topic. So um, can anyone give me an example? Maybe they want to share with the class uh, what their topic is. If you have an idea, you can uh, raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. Anyone want to share what their topic is? Or what they're thinking of. Maybe they haven't formalized it yet. That's all right. Any ideas percolating? Okay, well, well um, hopefully I'm getting some something coming in through the chat. Um, I will say that the only parameter for the topic is that it has to be related to the class, right? So this class is about women and world religions, but Honestly, the content of this class, as I mentioned last week, in terms of, you know, truly understanding what feminism is, it's not really just about women, right? It's going to be about anyone who has been, quote unquote, marginalized or excluded, right, from a particular group or institution or set of religious doctrines about enlightenment or whatever it is. So you don't even necessarily have to restrict it to women, um, but as long as it's relating in some way to sex, gender, sexual orientation in terms of identity, that will be considerable, uh, that would be considered relevant, right, to the class. Um, so just to give you an idea of the parameters, um, it could be one of the religious traditions we're talking about, it could be one of the many traditions that we're not going to get a chance to talk about in this class, right, really the, the choice is up to you, so, so make sure to pick something that, that you're really passionate about. All right, so I'm not getting any sorts of... Uh, Anyone who wants to share their idea for a possible topic, I, I hope you all have started thinking about it. Again, this is due tomorrow. Um, but just to let you know, you can change your topic down the road. Of course, you're not going to want to wait too long, right? Because each week, our writing assignment is going to build off of each other. And so you don't want to make more work for yourself by changing it, you know, three weeks from now. And then you have to go back and redo, you know, three weeks worth of work to catch up. So again, you can change your topic after tomorrow. But just know the sooner you decide on something, the, the better it's going to be for you. Okay, so any uh, questions about the writing assignment or the discussion? Uh, Molly, I saw your question. I'm, I'm happy to chat with you more if you have other questions about the discussion. But um, general questions? Okay, not seeing any hands. Right. Again, you feel free to type in your questions in the chat if you have them. All right. The other piece of the assignment, uh, our first set of assignments that are due this week is our quiz. Right. So we have our first quiz coming up. And who can tell me when that is due? Sunday. Yes. Good. <laughs> right. Um, so again, right. I have a very generous late policy, but again, you don't want to wait <laughs> on these quizzes because it's a lot of content, right? So this first quiz is not only going to be covering this week's material, but also week one, right? So this, this first quiz will be quite robust. Um, and just know that the number of questions on every quiz changes. And so the time limit changes, right? And so I usually do around three to five minutes uh, per question is how I figure out the time. Um, of course, if you have any sort of accommodation and you need extended time, make sure to work with the DSS office and me so that we can get that set up for you. Um, the beauty of uh, taking these quizzes on Canvas and that I don't have any of those um, uh, like surveying 
uh, technology thing set up. So no one's going to be like watching you take the quiz or anything like that. Um, you know, it's open book, open note, have your materials ready ahead of time, have them organized. I try to uh, set up the questions in chronological order, right? So the beginning of week one through week two, right? So uh, just make sure you're using the best use of your time. Um, you do get two attempts on each quiz, okay? So uh, before you take your second attempt, you are allowed one chance to look at your answers. It's not going to tell you the correct answer. Of course, if it's like a true or false, you can figure out which one it was, but um, you can at least take note of which ones you got wrong so you don't accidentally, you know, pick the same answer the second time you take it. But you only get one chance to do that. Um, so just make sure, again, that we're... Uh, strategizing right and and using these parameters to our benefit whether that's you know taking notes about wh what you got wrong or whatever it is in between um and only uh, again there's no there's no deduction for taking it late so it's not like you have to have both of your attempts finished by sunday um but i would encourage you to at least have taken your first attempt by the deadline so as to keep up with the uh, pace of the class becca you have a question yeah, I just have a quick question about the quiz. Is it like multiple choice or do you have to write paragraphs or what sort of format is it? Excellent question. So it's all multiple choice, true, false. We're going to be doing plenty of writing in our discussions and writing assignments. So no, no typing out answers for the quizzes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think that covers everything for our assignments, our first set of graded assignments, right? Initial post due Friday. Peer responses due by Sunday. Um, I guess I will say one other last thing about the peer responses. Um, in your practice discussion, right, you were just responding to their post. But now that we're going to be attaching the drafts for our writing assignments, your peer responses also need to include a peer review of that draft. And so each week I provide you with a rubric that you're going to use to fill out. It kind of looks like a lot, but the idea is that it just tells you what kind of feedback to give depending on how well they did or didn't follow the instructions, right? So make sure that um, we're doing those in in their uh, complete completeness uh, so that you don't lose any points. All right, so if you have any other questions about assignments, please uh, stay after class or email me and I'm happy to answer them for you. All right, so now we're going to get um, to our content. Uh, so last week, right, we had an introduction to Four major things. Who can remind me in the chat? What were the four major concepts that we introduced last week? You can type in one of them. You can type in all four of them. Logic, good. What else? Good philosophy and what it is, right? Okay, and then two more. Feminism, excellent. And the last one, good. Religion, awesome. Okay, so this is sort of right our crash course into some overarching concepts, right? Philosophy is giving us the sort of approach or perspective from which we're approaching this topic in the class, right? That may or may not align with what our personal beliefs are, right, about these various religious traditions, but that's okay, right, because we're not here to assess anyone's personal beliefs, right, we're here to assess ideas and the reasons why one may or may not think a particular position is preferable to another one, right, so if we're talking about, you know, different views of God, different views of the afterlife, different views of sex, gender, right, these types of things, the idea is that we want to look at various perspectives and understand the strengths and weaknesses of all of them, right? Of what are the things that certain views capture well? What are areas that need to be um, maybe strengthened, right? That need a little bit more work, okay? So again, that's the perspective we're taking. Logic, again, is going to be the groundwork for us obviously creating our own positions in the writing assignment, but also it's going to give you a lens through which to analyze other people's arguments, right? So we're obviously going to be preferring deductively valid arguments, right, that try to guarantee their conclusion over inductive arguments, right, which only make their conclusions more likely or more probable. And so you might find yourself using those tools outside of this class, right, to assess other people's reasoning. Feminism, right, why are we talking about that? Well, right, not only does it have a lot of misconceptions, but as I mentioned last week, 
it's really the feminist theologians who are going to be giving us um, the greatest variety of options for how to solve the problems that we encounter when it comes to the way certain religious traditions have viewed women or again, people who have historically been marginalized. All right, and then of course, what counts as a religion is gonna be important for us because as we're gonna see when we start getting into each religious tradition and that's clear right off the bat with the indigenous traditions we're looking at this week is that sometimes the problems that certain groups of people have faced aren't necessarily coming from the religion itself, but maybe some other historical context that was going on at the time. Right. And so that's going to be part of the unpacking that we need to do when we learn about these traditions and we learn about the way they viewed uh, certain types of identities is, like I mentioned, these religions have changed a lot over time. And so how they viewed a group of people at one point is not going to be the same as the way they were viewed viewed at the beginning right or throughout its entirety or how they're viewed today. And so we want to understand what potentially contributed right to those problematic views if they weren't there from the beginning right and so separating the things that count as the religion from the other elements that have influenced those views is going to be important work for us to do right and so that's why we looked at ninian smart seven dimensions of religion right to give us a sense of the ways in which these overlap with other secular things, right? That can have nothing to do with religion sometimes, right? And this is something that we're gonna see specifically when we get to um, the uh, Abrahamic religious traditions, right? Um, which are some of the more well-known ones, but um, even in the Eastern traditions, we're gonna note an interesting trend, which is that the further back you go in their histories, actually the better women were treated, which is weird right? <laughs> Where it doesn't necessarily seem intuitive. And so we want to figure out why that is, right? <laughs> what, what changed between the origins of those traditions and then some other point in its history where women were given a lower status, right? Or were marginalized in other groups. And so oftentimes we're going to see this correlate with colonialism, right? And imperialism, we're going to see this correspond with um, times of uh, whether it's war or economic struggle, right? And there are going to be maybe a lot of things that we see similarly going on today, right? So why do we see groups of people wishing to go back, right, to the way things were, right? What do they think is maybe under threat currently? And uh, there's a phrase now that, um, you know, a lot of these theologians didn't have to work with. Have you ever heard the phrase punch, punching down? Right. So this is a like a I mean, it could be literal. That's not how it's meant. Right. But the idea is that typically when someone is feeling that they do not have a certain level of power or control, right, enough to feel secure, the the very unfortunately human thing to do is to find spaces in our lives where we can feel that power and control. And this often has to do with exerting our power and control over people who have less power than us, right? And so um, the, you know, common thing of that today is like, you know, if someone's out having a bad day and they take out their anger on like a service worker, right? That's an example of punching down, right? They're taking their, their anger and frustration out on someone who's of a lower status than them, right? And so that sort of idea, I think, can help us understand these, these critical moments, right, in, of change throughout each of these traditions um, to see, you know, why is it that when uh, we have this political social unrest, we see certain groups targeted and being punched down upon, right, in this way. Um, and so with that, let's start off with our indigenous traditions. Um, this is obviously a very broad term. So who can tell us from the reading, the lectures, the content from this um, this week, who can tell us what it means to refer to something as indigenous, right? Because that's not the name of a religion or a religious tradition, right? So why do we call these indigenous? Molly. Um, because... Uh... These are traditions that are deeply rooted in a specific place um, and in a land and usually have uh, roots back to hunter-gatherer societies. 
Excellent, right? So the geographical location, right, and the ancestral heritage, right, of that location, as you mentioned, are exactly going to be the things that mark it as indigenous, right? And so um, this is something that not only refers to religions, right, but ethnicities and all other aspects um, of culture that, that we can think of. Good. And so what might constitute something then as an indigenous religion? Because surely most religions are associated with a place, right? <laughs> At some point. <laughs> so what makes something an indigenous religion as opposed to what we're going to be calling, um, and I'm only using this language because the, the texts use them this way, but what are typically referred to as the major world religions? What is going to separate an indigenous tradition from a major world religion? There's this sense in which um, major, right, is referring to like a sort of scale, uh, perhaps in the adoption of these traditions, right, across the globe. Um, and you're right that that sort of definition is not unique to indigenous religions, right? Like you aptly pointed out, and we'll see this next week, um, Hinduism, right, that the word itself is tied to a river in India, right? And so this, this particular region and the association is going to be important. And then we also include, you know, again, this is a trouble with labels, right? Because Surely we understand that the way that indigenous populations have been treated means that they have not been able to stay in their ancestral lands, right? They've been forced to relocate, right? Forcing a separation of them from their religious tradition, right? Um, and all of these things that are held sacred. Oscar, do you want to add to this? So oh. if if we note, because of the vast variety in indigenous traditions, we're going to see this as well, right? So the two indigenous traditions that our text and uh, the literature this week focuses on are those that come from Native American traditions and from African traditions. And because of these geographical differences and historical, right, sociopolitical differences in different parts of the world, also, these are just primarily developing at different times, right? Um, that we're going to see some interesting differences there. So let's let's get to that. What are some? So we'll we'll come back to the differences between indigenous traditions and major world religions. Um, primarily, these are going to have to do with metaphysical commitments that have to do with making distinctions or enforcing what we might call dualities in the world, right? And so the general approach, and uh, by metaphysics, this is a term in philosophy that refers to, uh, it literally just means the nature of reality, right? So like if you do physics, right, you're doing a part of metaphysics, right? You're focusing on a very specific part about of a larger umbrella that's looking at the nature of everything that exists and what it's like, right? So literally means beyond the physics. And so Right, the typical metaphysical commitments that we're going to see in indigenous traditions, who can tell me, are they going to highlight distinctions and dualities, or are they going to instead emphasize um, a more monistic, like one unified view of reality? So dualistic, meaning two, or monistic, meaning one. Which do which of the metaphysical commitments do we think indigenous traditions are going to have? Not the, not the one with two, monism, the one with one, <laughs> right? So good. We're going to see an emphasis on unity, right? Um, and the connection between anything that major world religions tend to differentiate between. So this can be in terms of views of time, right? Like past, present, and future, right? So the view of time in most major religious traditions is linear, Right. Whereas what we'll see in indigenous traditions and often sometimes in Eastern traditions as well is a more holistic, circular conception of time um, or the idea that, right, these things cannot be differentiated at all. Right. That everything is happening sort of all at once. Um, and so, again, not making those types of conceptual distinctions is what we're going to see in the indigenous traditions. And like I mentioned, in the Eastern ones, some of the Eastern ones as well. This also has to do with separation between sacred and natural, right? Which is something that we see are the sacred and the profane in the major world religions. We're going to see that everything in nature, right, in these indigenous traditions is going to be considered part of the sacred, and that includes all of us, right? So every single part of, of humanity and in terms of non-human species as well, right? Plants, animals, extending it to all things in nature, even inanimate 
forms of nature, right? Not making those conceptual distinctions either. All right, so there are lots of other uh, metaphysical distinctions that one could make. Um, those are some of the big ones. Again, you can take a look at the lecture. But so those are the differences between the, again, indigenous traditions and the major world religious traditions. So now let's look at the differences between some right, between indigenous traditions. So who can tell me one thing they learned or noticed that's different between, say, Native American indigenous traditions versus African indigenous traditions? Anyone notice any differences there? Anything that might distinguish one from the other besides their geographical location? You're right to pinpoint the historical differences that marked that, right? So we have Right, obviously, like I mentioned, colonialization, imperialization going on in the sub-African continent, um, the slave trade, right? All of these are going to deeply impact the way that African indigenous traditions have evolved because as we have hopefully all learned, right? Taking people from their ancestral land, forcing them into servitude does not typically come with religious freedom, right? <laughs> does not typically come with the idea that you can then believe whatever you want, right? And so individuals throughout history have had to sublimate or hide their, their native traditions, right, in order to keep them alive. And so we're going to come in contact with a lot of these again at the end of the quarter, Right. And notice how um, some of these what are considered newer religions, again, new just in terms of how long humanity has had religious traditions, newer religious traditions are really like combinations of indigenous and major world religions. Right. And again, this is perhaps out of necessity, not necessarily like out of choice. Right. To keep it alive. Good. So we have, have those sort of differences happening um, that are going to impact the roles that people can have. And you're right that because we don't see um, the, the genocide of the Native American people until later in human history, right, that's going to give them a different sort of opportunity, right, for women to have a, a role. Uh, good. So any other differences that we have noticed between Native American and African indigenous traditions. It says something about their views of these beings that, you know, going back to our comparison to major world traditions is probably very stark and different for us, right? So yeah, there is no sort of illusion that any divine entity is all good, right? Because when you have a conception of religion and spirituality that is based on nature, well, nature is not all good, right? There are a lot of things that cause suffering that occur in nature. And so, right, to these traditions, it wouldn't make sense to ascribe something so unnatural, like pure goodness, to a divine being if those divine beings are supposed to have a relationship with nature, right? And so um, this is going to, you know, provide a very unique conception of God um, that goes back to some of the language from week one, uh, I don't think we got a chance to talk about it, but the different types of theism, right? So these indigenous conceptions are going to be more like pantheism or panentheism, right? Where you see the world as residing in God, right? Or in something uh, that is the divine. But you're really not going to see again until later, until post-colonial uh, influence, the notion of a single God, right? All of these traditions are going to be talking about a plurality of divinities and the way that they talk about them is a little bit different. And so we tend to get, even though animism um, is prominent in both Native American and African indigenous traditions, this is the idea of um, seeing the divine in, in animal form, right? Or associating them with different types of animal species. We'll see this in both traditions, but it is metaphysically a little bit different. And so in the Native American traditions, we're going to see a more familial conception of the relationship between humans and the divine, right? Not only are all human beings part of the same family, right? As we are with other species, but the same goes with the divine, right? And so this is where, right, we might see um, a sort of relational component, again, not always one that is going to work out for the better, right? We, we don't always get along with our family members either. Right? There's, there's a lot of conflict in families, but part of that is that different family members are going to have different personalities, right? And so we get a, a lot of that variety here. 
Whereas in the African traditions, we're going to see, again, even though this can come in the form of animals and certain elements in nature, it's not that the animal itself is sacred, right? The way we might see in the Native American tradition, it's that certain animals might be possessed at certain moments by certain divine energies, right? So these are the energies that sort of um, move around, right? And can embody different beings at different times, right? So we have, again, this connection between humans and nature and the divine, but they're going to take uh, slightly different forms, right? In terms of, uh, this is probably gonna come up mostly in yeah, how, the, how the mythology, how the narrative goes, how certain rituals might be presented, or if you're looking to solve a certain problem, right? Why you might have to trick someone, <laughs> right? Into getting them to doing your bidding, right? To get them to react in the way that you want, because again, nature is gonna be this sort of spontaneous, uncontrollable thing otherwise. Good, good. All right, so um, speaking of the specific types of religious practices that we see in indigenous traditions, um, what are some of those? So you mentioned healing, right? That's gonna be an important one. Um, something that as we saw is going to actually provide a sort of unique opportunity for women, right? To have a significant role because um, healers, right, are going to have to be very attuned to nature, right, and the powers, the divine entities within and surrounding them. Um, and again, this is maybe reinforcing a certain idea of what it means to be a woman that may or may not be problematic, right? So there's historically been this association between nature and the feminine, which is not always used to women's advantage, right? But in this particular case of a healer, right, or someone who has certain divine or sacred knowledge, there, there's an opportunity there, right, for women to have, to have an elevated role. Um, but what are some other practices that uh, indigenous traditions might undertake outside of healing? But there's usually, yeah, it's a, uh, I am now I'm blanking on what it's called too, like a rite of passage, right? Yeah. Usually marking yeah. transition from youth into adulthood. Um, and yeah, these ceremonies can, they're often more cultural, right? Uh, in terms of the details of how they're done. But you're right in that they do take on a very uh, religious element to them in the sense that, right, it's not that, I mean, yes, your body is going through, right, a change, but often it's about the the psychological, the spiritual change, right, the maturity that changes when you leave childhood and enter adulthood. And there's some really fascinating practices um, that blur the lines between genders in these traditions. And I'm thinking of one uh, you'll have to forgive me. I can't remember exactly which tribe uh, practiced it, but it because the feminine and things associated with um, being a woman, like child rearing, right, are associated with nature and the power of creation. There is this sense that, again, perhaps women have been maybe controlled more, right? The idea is that maybe men have feared this creative power, right, that women have or have been envious of it. And one bit of evidence for that is a particular ritual in which um, in going from boyhood into manhood, right? Because uh, in this particular tradition that um, I'm referencing, there was no uh, third gender, right? Or any other non-binary option. The ceremony itself actually was meant to replicate the, the biologically female process of menstruation. And so this would involve young boys uh, or men in the group working with the young boys to basically engage in uh, self-mutilation of their genitals um, to mimic the bleeding process, right, that a young girl would go through as she is becoming a woman, right? And so the idea is that this is meant to, again, it's like they're trying to capture a power, right, that another group is seen as having and using that for themselves. There's also some really interesting um, homoerotic elements to these rituals in which, um, you know, without one-on-one -on -one sexual contact, try to say this is not graphically as possible, without physical contact, um, older men in the tribe would, you know, have to, I don't know exactly how they went about doing this, but they would um, retrieve their semen and the young boys would consume it as part of the ritual, right? And so again, just very different 
and non non traditional in terms of our Western conceptions of gender, sexual orientation, right? Things that are meant to blur the lines a little bit between these categories. So some interesting rituals there. Good. What are some other? Um, so I, I see some Molly. You've mentioned some other ceremonies here as well, right? Good. A lot of it focusing on again the psychological right elements of people's experience um, as well as the physical. What other practices do indigenous traditions partake in? Yeah, no, I'm glad that you mentioned its connection with medicine, um, right? So a lot of things that have been deemed magic, right, <laughs> are really just precursors to modern science, right? And so we're gonna see this a lot in Taoism as well, but it certainly plays a role in the way um, you know, we're familiar with like the, the Salem witch trials, right? These were just women healers, right? These were women practicing medicine at a time they were not allowed to, right? And so they must be communing with some, if they are, you know, having solutions to things that the actual doctors are not able to solve and they're using different methods, right? Of course, right, the binary, if, if one is good, the other must be problematic, right, and, and suspect. Um, yeah, good. So there's going to be a lot of these elements of using things from nature, right, very natural remedies for things, right? So now we have like naturopaths and things like that, right? Um, and this is basically the same idea. Um, there's actually a really wonderful book about this. Um, uh, it's called I Tituba. Uh, the Black Witch of Salem, um, and it's about the Salem witch trials from her perspective. She was um, the, I think, the only Black woman to be held on trial as a witch, um, and it focuses a lot on the fact that she was using, right, elements from her religious heritage, right, and spiritual tradition as a healer and to deal with, right, trying to remedy people's lives, right, whether it be to ward off evil spirits or curses or deal with something like this, trying to protect people, and how that was, of course, right, weaponized against her. It's an excellent book. It's not very long. I would highly recommend it. Um, think... But it's going to be some of the um, newer religious traditions that we see at the end of the quarter, along with Santeria as well, right? Uh, yeah, so these are absolutely going to be those mixtures, not just like, yeah, I mentioned of uh, indigenous and major world religions, but also because we have different tribes merging as well, right? Yeah, good. Excellent point. So if we're focusing on, right, especially these acts of healing and ceremony and rituals, who can tell me what is the actual spiritual phenomena that's supposedly occurring during these events that gives them their power what what's often said to be happening during these rituals right so a, a unique element of indigenous traditions is going to be this connection between something supernatural right whether it be a, a divine being energy or even an ancestral spirit, right? Just something beyond the physical realm that you know most people are able to perceive. And the idea is that certain people are going to be, uh, we would probably call them now mediums, right? They're going to be this sort of bridge between the living, right? And the, the non-physical world. And it is that connection that is supposed to be the source of power. And so this, um, these are typically described as sort of out-of-body experiences, right? There's been a lot of empirical evidence to verify that something cognitive, something is going on when people enter these trance-like states, right? So it's not that people are are lying, right? Or, I mean, not that some people can't perform this, right? But the idea is that there are at least some documented cases of something is going on, right? That uh, we can that we can measure empirically, um, and often people afterwards can uh, they can report no memory of it, right? So they they are unable to remember whatever they said or did. Um, sometimes it's right. Usually the idea is that whatever uh, entity they're being connected to is right speaking or working through them. Right. Um, often afterwards, the individual will be very drained. You probably right noticed this in the healing story as well. The physical toll that it takes. I always think of um, the Green Mile. Have any of you seen that movie? 
Oh, it's beautiful. Or, I mean, the book is, is lovely as well, but um, another uh, highly recommend. <laughs> but um, one of there's there's a little bit of this to that right story where he uh, one of the prisoners um, on death row is able to take on uh, the burdens, as it were. I'm not I'm trying not to give too much away. <laughs> uh, take them on from other people's. But afterwards, right, it, it takes a very, very physical toll on him. Um, oftentimes, again, people will be become physically ill afterwards. Right, so there are again um, verifiable elements of of what is happening to their body, but the supposed explanation, right, is again that there is this out of body experience, and it can go in any direction, right? It's not always an elevated experience, right, to a being that we again might attribute good intentions to. It can work the other way as well, right? So again, there's no all goodness in in these traditions just like you're not going to see there be all evil entities as well right it's it's going to be this ongoing uh dance and balance right uh between the different energies good right so we have that sort of uh spiritualism these ecstatic right moments of ecstasy right out of body experiences um with mediumship uh possession um, often we, uh, I, I shouldn't say that we would call them mediums. That's a very Western term. They would most likely be called shamans, right? In a, in a certain tradition, or again, whatever the, uh, the name is for the healer in that tradition. Um, good. So any, uh, before we, oh, we only have a few minutes left. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to ask questions about that just because I want to give us a chance to talk about this, but one of the things that comes up a lot when discussing indigenous traditions are again, things that don't necessarily come from that tradition. And this is why I've included elements of female genital cutting and female genital mutilation in this week's content, because oftentimes we see these practices associated with certain religions and not just indigenous religions. It's um, actually now being more associated with um, uh, Islam, but that is not accurate either, right? So I, I just want to make clear that these these traditions don't endorse these practices, right? But it's important to find out where they do overlap with the religious tradition, especially if perhaps you're interested in fighting against certain practices, right? If people use a religious justification for them, it's important to be able to debunk that, right? <laughs> if again, if that's if that's something that's important to us, and so um, I do want to again highlight the gendered elements of cutting and mutilation. Um, there are going to be some important differences between female genital circumcision and what we will call male circumcision, right? So uh, really briefly, um, can someone maybe mention some of the big differences or just one of the big differences between, between these practices? So there is this important function that FGC or FGM is supposed to have in terms of maintaining a woman's purity, and I'm putting air quotes around all this nonsense, right? Okay, <laughs> right. So the idea there is that you're literally trying to lock down someone's body such that it cannot be used in a way you deem inappropriate before the time you deem it appropriate, right? Uh, in which case, we're talking here primarily in the confines of marriage, but you know that that is going to differ exactly what that looks like, right? As well, different times throughout human history, different parts of the world. Um, one of the things that's so stark, though, is when if you've had a chance to watch any of the media about it, um, and it's it's hard to watch, but I think it's important to understand because oftentimes you see the women upholding these practices more so even than the men, right? And that is going to be really important for us to understand in terms of how these views get passed down, right? And how we want to upend them is that, right? We're not, right? Again, feminism is not about blaming the men <laughs> for everything, right? The idea is that we need to understand the role all of us play, right? In upholding these traditions. And um, it's important to understand, right? The way that women view it, but also the realities of what it's like for them, right? So yeah, saying that it, oftentimes there was a, a narrative about it, you know, being meant to help women's keep them healthy, right? Keep them clean and all these things when the reality is very much the opposite, right? That because of the circumstances under which most of these procedures are performed, they're not sterile, right? They're not going to be the conditions under which um, they can get proper uh, rehabilitative care, right? So lots of uh, infections afterwards. And for a lot of the women, um, the, the stitching is not even torn on their wedding night, but sometimes not even until fully until childbirth, 
right? And so the re-traumatization over and over again. And there is actually an interesting pushback, uh, in case any of you were thinking about a possible paper topic. <laughs> There's some interesting pushback against male circumcision now, even in the West, right? And it's because some have been starting to look at studies to say, well, maybe it does in fact lessen the sensitivity for men as well, right? Because surely there is nerve damage happening anytime you're forming any, any sort of genital mutilation. And the claims about hygiene, some have argued are very outdated, right? So the idea is that, well, male circumcision helps to reduce the transference of STDs. And many have said, well, at one point that was probably true just because as, as human hygiene has evolved, like people just didn't clean themselves as often as we clean ourselves now, right? How people take, you know, up to multiple showers in one day. And I know post COVID it's even more, right? We're all even more on hygiene alert, but right? The idea is that because our basic acts of hygiene have improved, that those sort of benefits are even nominal. But again, it's an ongoing debate. There hasn't been as much research into it, right? And so there's some new views there. But again, whatever the your views are on the subject, right? We just want to understand what the justification has been for it, whether those claims are in fact true or not, right? And then if there are problems, what we can do to solve it. All right, so there's a lot to go on here with Indigenous traditions. I'll hang back um, for anyone who wants to chat. Next week, we are moving on to our first major world religion. So that is going to be Hinduism. Um, I am going to the best of my ability in chronological order with the major world traditions. Um, and so that's dictated the, the order in which we'll go through them. So because of that, we will be saving the Abrahamic traditions until the second half of the quarter, right? Because those did not emerge until much, 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 much later in time, right? And it'll be really, really, I mean, it's fun for me. I hope it's fun for you to see how ideas have influenced each other, right? So as one religion evolves and another one emerges, right? How has that history of ideas impacted the traditions that we are very knowledgeable about today? Um, one thing that we're not going to get to cover in this class that we cover in uh, the regular world religions class is the tradition of Zoroastrianism. And so for those of you who are interested in precursors to the Abrahamic tradition, I would encourage you to take a look at that religious tradition as well. Um, I'll type it into the chat for you. So that's the other old tradition that we're not going to get to take a look at. But we're going to start with Hinduism next week. Um, I do have some recorded lectures on the beginnings of uh, Hinduism. And so that I hope you have a chance to look at those because just learning about the religion is a lot. And then we need to talk about how that religion views women. OK, so uh, try to familiarize yourself as much as you can with that lecture material so that, um, again, we can focus our class time next week on any questions you have. All right, uh, for those of you who have to go, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Good luck with your first set of assignments and I will see you next week. And for the rest of you again, I'm happy to hang out and chat.